In this video, we'll cover the higher level section of A1.2 on nucleic acids, which deals mostly with an in-depth look at DNA structure and experimentation. So when we were drawing a nucleotide and we were drawing deoxyribose, we were just drawing it as a pentagon, right? A five-sided sugar. If I zoom in and take a look at the actual molecular structure, I'm going to see that it's five-sided because there are one, two, three, four, five carbons. So that's why we call it a pentose sugar. And these carbons are actually numbered. So the numbering system goes like this. This is carbon number one, two, three, four, and five. And because they are numbered, that tells us that there's a five prime end, okay? So I like to think of that as almost like the top of the house, and a three prime end. And so five prime and three prime relate to the five and the three carbons. So this is really what we mean when we say anti-parallel. So on one strand, you're going to have this five prime end up at the top, right? So that would be this carbon here. And at the end of the strand is the three prime end. And on that other strand, remember that's anti-parallel, you're going to have the three prime end facing this way and the five prime end facing this way, okay? So that's really what anti-parallel means, five to three on one end and three to five prime on the other end. One of the reasons why this is so important is because new nucleotides can only be added to the three prime end. So if I have this nucleotide here, I can definitely add a new nucleotide to the three prime end, okay? And I can form that covalent bond right here. Remember, this is the three prime end, that's fine. What I cannot do is add a nucleotide to the five prime end, you cannot do that. So if I'm looking at this molecule here, I could add new nucleotides down here on this strand or new nucleotides up here on this strand, but I cannot add any to the five prime end of either molecule. So we're gonna leave it at just the structure right now. There are other topics that deal with things like DNA replication and protein synthesis where we kind of put that knowledge into action. But for now, it's just important to understand the structural components of DNA and what five prime and three prime mean. So going into a little bit more depth about that complementary base pairing, remember adenine can only pair with thymine and guanine can only pair with cytosine when we're talking about DNA. And what we're really saying is that in each of those complementary base pairs, you're going to have one purine and one pyrimidine. Again, one purine and one pyrimidine. And so purines and pyrimidines have a different structure, but if you have one of each, okay, you'll have one double ringed uh, base and one single ringed base. And so what that's going to do is that's going to create base pairs that are of equal length. So you can see that down here, that each base pair is an equal length. And that's going to help increase the stability of our DNA DNA molecule. All right, so it's important that this DNA molecule stays intact. It has all of your genetic information in it. And stability is a really big thing. One of the things that helps with that um, is that purine to pyrimidine bonding. Another thing that enhances the stability of the DNA molecule is a structure called a nucleosome. Now, nucleosomes are only going to be found in eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotes like bacteria, don't have nucleosomes because these nucleosomes are structures built around something called a histone protein, okay? So let's take a look at that structure here. So I've drawn the DNA in black in this picture, and here this DNA is wrapped twice around a core of eight special kinds of proteins called histone proteins. You may sometimes hear this referred to as an octomer of histone protein, octo meaning eight. In addition to that core of eight histone proteins, we also have what's called an H1 histone. That's a special one. It's outside of that main core, and it's right here. And that's going to help stabilize that nucleosome, 
when it's time for DNA to condense into chromosomes, this H1 histone becomes important as well. So here I've drawn one, two, three of these nucleosomes, and these nucleosomes are joined together by a segment of DNA called linker DNA. So that's the DNA that is in between these histone proteins. Now, this topic fo focuses on the structure of DNA and nucleosomes. There are some really important functions when it comes to things like condensation into chromosomes, or um, regulating genetic expression, but those bits are found in other topics. So this is really about the structure. So important things to know, again, only in eukaryotes, not prokaryotes. And we should be looking for eight histone proteins um, joined together by linker DNA and those H1s to stabilize. Biologists knew that DNA existed long before they knew what it was actually for. And so in the 1950s, the scientist team of Hershey and Chase sat out to answer the question, what molecule is it that is carrying the genetic information? Is it DNA or is it the proteins? So they knew the composition of a chromosome was DNA and proteins, but it wasn't known yet which one of those was actually the storage molecule of that hereditary information. So they had this question to answer. The cool thing about narrowing that down to DNA and proteins, so I'll do these here in yellow, DNA and proteins, is that viruses also happen to be made of DNA and proteins. So viruses have this like protein coat and they also have DNA. So they made a perfect um, experimental tool for trying to figure out which of these molecules was responsible for carrying the genetic information. And they knew from the start that viruses infect their host by injecting their genetic material. So they knew that. They just had to figure out whether they were injecting proteins or whether they were injecting DNA. So they grew two different groups of these bacteriophage viruses um, in different radioactive mediums. So my rule of thumb is if you want to make something invisible, visible, you make it radioactive. So they grew some of these bacteriophages in radioactive sulfur and sulfur adheres to proteins, okay? So these viruses ended up with a radioactive uh, protein. They grew another set of viruses in radioactive phosphorus, and phosphorus becomes incorporated into DNA. So these had radioactivity in their DNA. After doing that, they let each of these bacteriophages infect some bacterial cells. And again, the important learning here is that viruses inject whatever their genetic material is. Then they spun these cells through a centrifuge. And that's important because centrifuges are going to separate things uh, based on weight. And so what's going to go to the bottom is the heaviest bit. And the heavy bit down here at the bottom is called the pellet. That pellet will contain cells because they're heavy. And don't forget, those cells are now going to have the genetic material from the virus inside of them. The liquid that remains up at the top is called the supernatant, and that's going to have, again, those leftover virus particles because those viruses, whatever wasn't the genetic material, will remain outside of the cell. So the value of having these um, radioactively tagged was that they were finding that the ones that they grew in the radioactive sulfur it was the supernatant that was radioactive, while the bacteriophages that were grown in radioactive phosphorus, that was the pellet that was containing that radioactivity. And so that tells us, or told them rather, I don't wanna take credit, that it was DNA that was the genetic material that it was not the protein, okay? So DNA was what the viruses injected, that is what ended up in the cells, and that is the main learning here from the Hershey Chase experiment.
Another experiment that you should know is Shargaff's experiment. So Shargaff did some experiment on the relative amounts of different nitrogenous bases, right? Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. And he was really taking a close look at the prevailing thought of the day, which was the tetranucleotide hypothesis. So this word tetra meaning four, right? So this is kind of a real simplified drawing, but if you can imagine, this is what people thought um, nucleotide consisted of, which was these A's, T's, G's, and C's in equal amounts. And then you imagine these tetranucleotides stacking on top of each other. For that to be true, if I analyzed a DNA sample, then I would expect it to be 25% adenine, 25% cytosine, 25% guanine, and 25% thymine. They would all be present in equal amounts. But we can look at some of Shargaff's data down here. What he was finding was that within a species, we didn't have the same amount of A's, T's, G's, and C's. They were different. And that helped to falsify that tetranucleotide hypothesis. So we can't ever prove anything. As scientists, all we can do is falsify it. And this was great examples um, of falsification. So two main learnings came out of this experiment. Um, well, a few maybe. <laughs> so one, the tetranucleotide hypothesis was not the right hypothesis. The second thing that we can learn from this is that A's and T's were always found in relatively same amounts, and so were G's and C's. And that gave rise to this idea of complementary base pairing. So you'll often hear it referred to as Shargaff's rule of complementary base pairing, that A and T are equal and G are C and C are equal. Now what we'll notice is the amount of each of those bases is different in each organism. Again, unity and diversity. Here's the di diversity part, that these different organisms have different amounts of each of these bases. But the unifying theme here is that in every organism, the amount of A is going to equal the amount of T, and G and C should be equal because they're always paired together. So that's the unity part. One of the interesting things down here, this poliovirus doesn't have any Ts. Any guesses? It has to do with the poliovirus using RNA as its um, uh, nucleic acid or its genetic material, so it wouldn't have any Ts, it would have Us. Um, but again, here, a great example of unity and diversity. All living things are going to have equal amounts of purines and pyrimidines. A and T should be equal, G and C should be equal, but we'll find diversity in terms of the amounts of those between species.